Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. All right. Last evening, I was deep in thought, deep in the heart of the pastor's study, deep in the church parsonage on Merrimack Avenue, and I came across what might be a prophetic forewarning of the calamities that we're currently experiencing in the year 2020. A prophetic forewarning of what we're experiencing right now. It's a video clip from a movie that was released 81 years ago, August 25, 1939. Now, I'm going to show it to you. Doreen, are you ready? Ready. All right. Christine, are you ready? Dwight, are you ready? Here we go. <laughs> In 2020, we start to think to ourselves, are we living in some kind of strange Wizard of Oz nightmarish dream? What in the world is happening here? Yeah, I think that pretty much sums up 2020 so far. It's been a kind of rough seven months, and we've still got five months to go down this yellow brick road. So let's see what happens. You know, speaking of prophecy and foretelling the future, forewarning of future calamities. When a lot of people hear about the book of Daniel, that's exactly what they think of. And it's true. Daniel foretells a lot, foreshadows a lot, predicts coming calamities, triumphs, and wars. But there's much more to the book of Daniel than these visions in chapters 7 through 12, or Especially there's much more in the book of Daniel than a few highly debated verses in Daniel chapter 9. You see, Daniel was in exile, living far from home in a foreign land that was hostile to this faith. I don't know about you, but that sounds pretty familiar to me this evening. Daniel was a citizen of Jerusalem, living in Babylon. As Christians, we are citizens of heaven, Amen. living here on earth. Like Daniel, we may serve the interests of earthly kings or our boss or someone else, but our ultimate loyalty is to whom? Jesus, to the King of glory, the King of kings and Lord of lords, Jesus Christ, our sufficient Savior and risen Lord. We are ambassadors for Christ. We represent the interests of King Jesus here in our world today. It's as though God is making his appeal to lost people through us. We are imploring them, be reconciled to God. So we're citizens of heaven representing the interests of the kingdom of heaven here on earth. That's who we are, and that is what we do. But there's a roaring lion seeking to devour us with ripping claws and powerful jaws. Just meet the main volume button. There's a roaring lion seeking to devour us with ripping claws and powerful jaws. There are tigers who stalk our steps, and there's bears that get in our way. So lions and tigers and bears kind of sums up sometimes our experience as Christians. Now, Daniel knew a few things about lions, didn't he? In fact, the story that we're going to encounter this evening in Daniel chapter 6, the story of Daniel and the lions, that is one of the most famous stories in the entire Bible. But I've got to tell you, we've, we've been telling it not all wrong, but kind of wrong, mostly wrong in some cases. Uh, first of all, we tend to think of Daniel as perpetually 18 or 25 or 30 years old, and all the storybooks and all the cartoons and movies, Daniel's a young man. Daniel's actually probably at least 80 years old, probably as old as mid-80s up to 90 by this point in his life. So he's an old man, and he served the Lord faithfully 
his entire life. We also tend to think that Daniel was kind of a, living a happy, go-lucky, easy, carefree life until one day he's forced to make a decision. That day of decision comes when he must choose between praying to the one true God or praying to a human king. But that version of the story couldn't be further from the truth. First of all, Daniel, now over 80 years old, has lived a long and difficult, arduous, and yet joyful path of obedience to the Lord in the face of opposition from the world. We tell kids that Daniel spent a night in the lion's den. Wrong. Daniel lived his entire adult life in the den of lions. And so do all who have served the interests of heaven while living here on earth. The world, the flesh, and even the devil are allied against us. You know, three times in the Gospel of John, our King, Jesus, our Lord, refers to Satan as, quote, the ruler of this world. The apostles refer to him as the prince of the power of the air who masquerades as an angel of light who prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Like Daniel, we should follow the course marked out for us with faithfulness. As one author has said, it's a long obedience in the same direction. A long obedience in the same direction. 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 9 speaks to us as Christians in terms of exiles like Daniel, living far from home living in a place of hostility, a place of opposition to our faithfulness to the Lord. 1 Peter 5 and verse 9, speaking of this roaring lion seeking to devour, it says, Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. Our brothers and sisters in Christ are going through the same sufferings that we're experiencing. And as you know, if you stay connected to Voice of the Martyrs or other groups that work with persecuted Christians or missionaries that are in difficult to reach areas, there are countries around the world where Christians are being arrested for their faith, where Christians are being persecuted and even killed because they confess Jesus Christ as Lord and because they obey his command to make disciples. It says in verse 10, after you have suffered a little while. So suffering in scripture for exiles is assumed. After you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion, the reign, the kingdom forever and ever. Amen. Peter writes to us. As exiles. And so, like Daniel, we are to continue by the grace and power of God, walking that long path of obedience in the same direction. Now, tonight we'll see that the God of Daniel is the living God who endures forever. His kingdom will come, his will will be done, his reign and dominion are unstoppable and untoppable. He removes kings. And he sets up kings. Those who walk in pride, God is able to humble. Those who dare to live like Daniel will find the God of Daniel faithful to the end. He delivers from the flames. Sometimes he delivers through the flames. He shuts the mouths of lions. Even in exile, Jesus is with us. He said, behold, I am with you always, even to the very end. Of the age. He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. So let's walk with Daniel along this path of faithfulness, Daniel chapter 6. It may get a little bit scary at a couple of points, but I promise there's a happy ending. A happy ending, at least for Daniel, not a happy ending for everyone. And then we'll pause in our journey just long enough to consider a few daring decisions that we must make if we too would dare to live like Daniel even when faithful living means life in the lion's den. Let's talk about life in the lion's den. First of all, through the experience of Daniel, and then as we consider our own experience as disciples of Jesus today. 
Daniel chapter 6, verse 1. I hope you have your Bibles open as we go. It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satraps. Now, you might remember in the last chapter that the kingdom of Babylon gave way in a night, King Belshazzar feasting with his people, and while he feasted and dined and drank, and while he blasphemed the one true God of all creation, his kingdom was taken from him, his life was ended, and Darius the Mede receives the kingdom. Some believe that Darius or Darius is another term for Cyrus the Great. So Darius sets over the kingdom 120 satraps to be throughout the whole kingdom, and over them three high officials, of whom Daniel was two, of whom Daniel was one, to whom these satraps should give account, so the king might not suffer loss. So this is a vast kingdom the largest kingdom the world had ever known to this date. And these satraps were meant to collect taxes and tribute, but because they were so far removed from the king and his high officials, there was opportunity for corruption, for embezzlement, for padding their own wallets and purses. And so the king wisely sets over them three men, one of whom is Daniel, to make sure that they all stay in line. Then this Daniel became distinguished above all of the other high officials and satraps because an excellent spirit was in him. Now this is the third or fourth time that we've heard Daniel referred to as having an excellent spirit within him. And the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. So Daniel distinguished himself to such an extent that King Darius planned to make him prime minister over the entire kingdom. But something was wrong. Daniel's faithfulness to the Lord, his excellence in everything he did, made him some powerful enemies. You see, when you rise to the top, when you faithfully obey, when you excellently serve and do your best in all things, there will be people who will oppose you. It could be jealousy. It could be they want to turn you for their own purposes and they find they're unable. We're not sure what led these other high officials. Perhaps it was jealousy over this exile from Judah who had climbed the ring so quickly. We're not sure. It says in verse 4, Then the high officials and the satraps sought to find ground for complaint against Daniel with regard to the kingdom. And so they watched his dealings. They observed him as he counted the money. They observed him as he dealt with the king. And guess what? He did everything well. They could find no ground for complaint or any fault because Daniel was faithful. Underline that in your Bible. Daniel was faithful. And no error, no fault was found in him. Then these men said, we shall not find any ground for complaint against this Daniel. Unless, and then the wheels begin to turn. Unless we find it in connection with the law of his God. You see, Daniel was known as a man of excellence in all things that he did. But he was also known as a man of God. And if there was one thing they could catch him in, one thing that might offend the king, it would be that Daniel's loyalty to God was greater than his loyalty to his boss, greater than his loyalty to his employer, greater than his service to the king. And so Daniel's faithfulness earned him some powerful enemies. He couldn't be corrupted. He couldn't be bought. No believable charge against him could ever be made. He was blameless. If they were going to give him, only his obedience to God would be his downfall, at least in the eyes of the rulers. So they hatched this plan. Verse 6, these high officials, these satraps, came by agreement to the king, and they said to him, Oh, King Darius, live forever. They start to pad his ego. All the high officials of the kingdom, the prefects, the satraps, the counselors, the governors, are agreed that the king should establish an ordinance and enforce an injunction that whoever makes petition to any god or man for 30 days 
30 days, except to you, O king, shall be cast into the den or pit of lions. A den of lions is a pit of ferocious, hungry lions. We know that lions roamed the Near East, the Mesopotamia area at this time. The town's folks, especially those living out in the country, were afraid of these lions. The people feared them greatly. The nobles hunted them for exciting sport, and the Medes and the Persians even captured them, sometimes seeking to train them, and other times taking the most ferocious of them, placing them in a pit in the ground with a small opening at the top, and using that as an extreme and a horrible form of execution. Can't even imagine something so horrible as that. And so this was their idea. Everybody must pray to you, O king. And now, O king, verse 8, establish the injunction, sign the document, so it cannot be changed. According to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be revoked. So once the law is made and signed by the king, in the Medes and the Persians, and the way they do things, it cannot be over. Turned. Therefore, King Darius signed the document and the injunction. And we might think to ourselves, this guy seems kind of smart. Didn't he know he was getting played like a fiddle? But that's what pride will do. Pride will lead to our fall. We've seen that time and time again in the book of Daniel. That pride and human hubris against the Lord leads to the fall, to either the demise of people or to their great detriment. Now, King Darius likely saw this idea as an opportunity to unite his vast kingdom. Not so much maybe in praying to him as a god, but in all these peoples praying to their own gods through Darius, like he was the high priest. And so he would unify the people in religion. He saw the religious devotion of his subjects as a political tool to gain power. I'll say that again. He saw the religious devotion of his people as a political tool to gain power, just as many politicians and pundits in America do today. So beware when people start speaking of nationalism or American patriotism as if it were a religion. There are some people who think of patriotism as if it were a religion, as if that was their truth that they worshipped. Like Daniel, we may serve the interests of the nation in which we live. We should be good citizens. We should do all things in excellence. But like Daniel, we must remember that worship is reserved for God alone. And we must be aware when anyone, whether it's somebody from the right side, conservative side of things, whether it's somebody from the left side, more progressive, liberal side of things, or somebody in the middle, we must be aware of those who would manipulate our faith even for their own political power and advancement purposes. We pray in one name, and we pray in one name only. The name at which every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We kneel at the cross and bow only before Jesus. Only Jesus is worthy of our worship. Even the greatest angel who revealed to John the visions of the apocalypse says, get up off your knees. Do not worship me. Worship the Lamb. Worship Jesus. And Jesus receives our worship. Why? Because he is God. He is the way, he is the truth, he is the life. No one comes to God the Father except through Jesus. So let's pick up the story in verse 10. How is Daniel going to respond? He's lived a long life of faithfulness. He doesn't want his life to end up him being eaten by lions. Is he going to fold? Is he going to just quietly go about worshiping the Lord and pretend that this never really happened, or just try to hide in the shadows, go on a long vacation, what's going to happen? When Daniel knew the document had been signed, so Daniel as a chief official was well aware of what was happening. 
He was well aware of the signing ceremony. I don't know if it was like when the president today signs a, a law, uh, signs a, a uh, whatever, a motion in the law, and then has all those different pens that he gives to the people who are signing as he signs a document as souvenirs. I don't know if it was something like that. Whatever it was, there's some kind of signing ceremony. Daniel knew the document had been signed. This irreversible law went into effect. What does he do? Does he run away and hide? No. Does he go on a long vacation? No. Does he shut the doors and windows of his house and quarantine for 30 days? No. What does he do? He goes into his house where he had windows in his upper chamber that opened toward Jerusalem. You see, Solomon in his dedication to the temple had instructed God's people in exile when not in Jerusalem to pray and look towards Jerusalem and to pray. In fact, I think it's helpful if we look at those verses in 1 Kings 8, verse 46. All right, so keep your, your finger in Daniel chapter 6 and flip over to 1 Kings chapter 8 and verse 46. Let's read what Solomon the king instructs his people to do. In his prayer, he says, if they sin against you, for there is no one who does not sin, and you are angry with them and give them to an enemy so that they are carried away to the land of the enemy, far off or near. So in other words, if you carry them off into exile, verse 47, yet if they turn their heart in the land to which they have been carried captive and repent and plead with you in the land of their captors, saying, we have sinned and have acted perversely and wickedly, if they repent with all their mind, with all their heart in the land of the enemies who carried them captive, and pray to you toward their land, which you gave to their fathers, the city that you have chosen, and the house I have built for your name. Then, O oh Lord, hear in heaven your dwelling place, their prayer and their plea, and maintain their cause. Forgive your people who have sinned against you, and all their transgressions they have committed against you, and grant them compassion in the sight of those who carried them captive, that they may have compassion on them. So in his prayer, the dedication of the temple, King Solomon instructs the people what to do if their sins become so great that God allows them to be carried into exile. And he says, you go and you look toward Jerusalem, you look toward the temple, and you pray, you confess your sins, you cry out to God, you ask him for help. And that's exactly what Daniel did. He continued his regular practice. He didn't do anything different. When he heard the king had signed the edict, he didn't change his lifestyle or his routine. He just did what Daniel did. He went to his house. He went upstairs. He looked out the window toward Jerusalem. He got down on his knees three times a day, morning, afternoon, and evening, down on his knees, praying to the Lord, giving thanks before his God, as he had done previously. You see, when you're living a faithful life continually, day by day, and something terrible happens like this king's verdict, you don't get all upset. You don't get all anxious. You don't start saying, what do I do? You just keep doing the faithful things you were doing before. Amen. You see, a life of faithfulness and obedience is a life of simplicity and a life of joy. And that's exactly what Daniel does. Now, who's watching him? Who's watching him? Those guys who hatched this plan. By the way, Daniel had his priorities straight, didn't he? In fact, we might say he had his priorities straight. Others were seeking to politicize religion. He rather was prioritizing, prioritizing his life. And there was no lack of evidence in proving Daniel's faithfulness. I asked you, if you were put on trial for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to prove your guilt? There certainly was in Daniel's life. It didn't take the men very long. They found Daniel making petition and plea before his God. And they came near and they said to the king, Oh, king, hey, king, don't you remember that injunction that you signed that Anyone who prays to any other god uh, but you during a 30-day period shall be cast into the den of lions. Remember that, O king? The king said, oh, yeah, I remember that. You know what? 
that stands fast. The law of the Medes and the Persians cannot be revoked. They like to say that. I think they kind of puff out their chest when they say that. The law of the Medes and the Persians cannot be revoked. Then they answered and said before the king, Oh yeah, king, remember Daniel? The guy that you wanted to make second in command, prime minister over the whole land? One of the exiles from Judah? He pays no attention to you, O king, or the injunction that you have signed. But he makes his petition to God three times a day. When the king heard these words, he was distressed. He knew that he had been had. He knew that these guys had pulled one over on him. And he labored till the sun went down to rescue Daniel. But these men by agreement came to the king later that evening. And they said to him, O king, don't forget the law of the Medes and the Persians. No injunction or ordinance the king establishes can be changed. So the king commanded that Daniel be brought and cast into the den of lions. And as his guards are taking charge of Daniel, as they are dragging him to that pit, before they throw him in, the king declares to Daniel, May your God, whom you serve continually, deliver you. That's how Daniel was known, as one who served God continually. Twice the king will refer to Daniel. Daniel was a servant of the king. This king thought he was all that, and yet he recognized that Daniel continually served the Lord. Daniel's path of faithful obedience was both well-worn and well-known. And the king speaks a deeper truth here of a higher power that he doesn't know, this God whom Daniel continually serves. So a stone is brought out and laid over the mouth of the den. The king seals it with his signet ring so that if anybody tried to move the stone and let Daniel out, it would be seen. Anybody who broke that seal would be punished, eaten, by the lions, along with Daniel. His own signet ring, that nothing might be changed concerning Daniel. The king goes home to his palace. He spends the night fasting. No diversions, no entertainment are brought to him. He tosses and turns in his bed. Sleep flees from him. The king can't rest. What about Daniel? Let me tell you, with God on your side, you can sleep better in a pit with ferocious lions than a king sleeps in his royal palace alone with his thoughts. Verse 19, at break of day, the king arose and went in haste to the den of lions. As he came near to the den where Daniel was, he cried out in a tone of great anguish. And so as the king is rushing to the pit of lions, a king doesn't just rush out of the palace. Just like the, the president could have just run out of the White House. What would have happened? There would be a team of secret service surrounding him and accompanying him. So the king will have his security detail accompany him. And there's probably a little bit of fanfare regarding his journey to the den of lions. And so the other nobles, those satraps and governors who put the king up to this, are probably there as well. The king declares to Daniel, Oh, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to deliver you from the lions? And as he says it, he hasn't slept all night. It says he says it with anguish. He's probably weeping. Probably the words barely come out as he yells them and stutters over them. Has your God been able to save you? I'm sure the security detail looks at one another nervously. The satraps and the governors who made this plot against Daniel look at one another gleefully until they hear a voice from the pit. And the voice says, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel. My God sent his angel. Time and time again in scripture, God sends his angels not only to bring messages to his people, but to protect his people from harm. God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouths. These lions were hungry. They were ferocious. They were wanted to eat Daniel in their own, but the angels shut their mouths. 
They have not harmed me because I was found blameless before you, before God, and also before you, O king. I have done no harm. Then the king was exceedingly glad. He commanded Daniel to be brought up out of the den. And so Daniel was brought up out of the den, and no kind of harm was found on him. Why? Because he had trusted in his God. That's what the text said. Because he had trusted in his God. It reminds me of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego when they went through the fiery furnace. When they came out, the angel of the Lord had protected them. Could be an angel from God. Could be the angel of the Lord himself, a pre-incarnate appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ that shut the, lo the, lo the mouths of the lions, that delivered Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego through the flames. They didn't even smell like smoke. When Daniel comes out of the pit, there's not a scratch to be seen on him. But Daniel's going to tear his clothes. The angel of the Lord shut the mouths of the lions. God is my judge. That's what Daniel means. Daniel was found blameless and faithful. You know, in the end, only God's opinion of us matters. Only God's opinion of us matters. So what about these guys? They had been trying to increase their own standing within the kingdom. Well, now the ground is taken out from under their feet. The king goes from exceeding gladness to exceeding madness to get revenge against these who had done this. The king commanded that those men who maliciously accused Daniel be brought and cast into the den of lions. And then in an act of great brutality, it says, their children and their wives along with them. And before they reached the bottom of the den, the lions overpowered them and broke all their bones in pieces. The story doesn't conclude there. It's a happy ending for Daniel, very unhappy ending for these guys and their families. Then King Darius wrote to all the peoples, nations, and languages that dwell on all the earth, Peace be multiplied to you. Peace be multiplied to you. Daniel's simple faithfulness was multiplied into a kingdom-wide witness. The king says, I make a decree that all in my royal dominion, people are to tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. He is the living God. God, enduring forever. His kingdom shall never be destroyed. His dominion shall have no end. He delivers and rescues. He works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. He who has saved Daniel from the power of the lions. So this Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus, the Persian. So we see that Daniel's entire adult life was spent in exile. It was spent in a figurative lion's den, yet God preserved him through it all, preserved him alive and unharmed, enabling him to prosper under successive kings from Babylon and the Medes and the Persians, until finally his prayers for Jerusalem were answered. God raised up Cyrus the Persian as his chosen servant to allow his people to go back to the land to rebuild the temple, to rebuild the walls, to reconstruct Jerusalem. God was faithful to the very end. Amen? Amen. 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 And so now let's talk for a few moments about our own life in the lion's den. Would you dare to be a Daniel? When I was a kid, I remember singing that song, my mom singing that song as she played the piano at our house. Dare to be a Daniel, dare to stand alone, dare to have a purpose firm, dare to make it known. If you would dare to be a disciple like Daniel, there are some decisions you'll have to make during your exile. And I want to share with you these decisions briefly. Number one, choose faithfulness no matter what the consequences. Choose faithfulness no matter what the consequences. The kings of this world tell you to bow before a golden statue or else you'll be cast into the fiery furnace. Faithfulness says no way. 
The kings of this world say, pray, pray for the king. They politicize religion. The faithful say, no way. Even if it means a den of lions. Choose faithfulness no matter what the consequences. The Apostle Paul tells young Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4 that a time is coming where people won't want to hear the truth of God's word anymore. Where people will have itching ears and they'll surround themselves with people who just say the words that they want to hear. Paul says, not you, Timothy, preach the word. Be faithful in season, out of season. Preach the word. The word has power. And then Paul says, you know what? It's been a tough road, but I fought the good fight. I finished the race. I've kept the faith. And now I know with confidence there is in store for me a crown of righteousness, and not just for me, but for all who faithfully serve the Lord. Choose faithfulness no matter what the consequences. I remember as a young boy... You know, thinking about baseball right now, baseball just starting up. The White Sox are one and two, and the Cubs are two and one. Hey, hey, there you go. All right. So, <laughs> the White Sox fans shaking their head. But I remember as a little boy, I was pretty good at baseball in my small town where I grew up, and I was on the All Star team. And our All Star team was in a big tournament. A whole bunch of little small towns got together at this big tournament there in Southwest Michigan. And I think I was nine years old. Our game was on Sunday morning. And at that time, Sunday morning was when you went to church. Now we've got Saturday night, we've got Sunday morning, we've got Sunday night, lots of different options and things. But back then, Sunday morning was when you went to church. And the coach said, you're going to be there for the game, right? It's at 10 a.m. on Sunday. And I said, no, I've got church. And the coach went over to my dad. Come on, Wes, you got to let your son play. My dad said, Jason, you, you can play if you want. It's okay. It's okay. We'll, we'll go to an evening service somewhere. I said, no, Dad. Sunday morning is when we go to church. The coach said, what? Jason, we need you. The other players came out to me. Jason, we need you to be there. And I said, no, I'm, I'm going to go to church. Well, well, you don't have to. Your dad said, no, that's, that's what I do. Now, I'm not saying that if you're in an all-star game and it's on Sunday morning, you can't play. But at that time, at that moment, the circumstances being what they were, I was convinced in my nine-year-old mind that faithfulness to God meant going to church on Sunday morning and not playing in that baseball game. I don't know what choices you face, probably ones with a lot more consequence than that. Choose faithfulness, no matter what other people think, no matter what the consequences. Number two, whatever you do, do it well. Boy, the work ethic of Daniel is something, if Christians worked like Daniel, if they were well known for being good employees, you want to be a good Christian employee, the first thing you should do is be a good employee. Some people think being a good Christian employee means witnessing all the time while they're working. Well, witnessing is a good thing, but if you want to be a good Christian employee, the first thing you have to do is be a good employee. Work hard. Whatever you do, do it well. Do it better than everybody else because you're doing it. For Jesus. Amen. Follow Colossians 3. In fact, take Colossians 3 to work with you. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. Whatever you do, do it well. Do it for Jesus. Third, set your priorities and pursue them. Set your priorities and pursue them. And whatever you do, in this election year, don't give in to that urge to politicize. Don't politicize, prioritize. Prioritize. Pray, pray for our country. Pray for our city. Pray for our neighborhood. Pray for the people who are hurting. Pray for the moms and dads who lost little ones and young men and women in violence. Pray for those who have no hope. Pray for those who have experienced injustice. We don't have to line up on this side or on that side of something. We can pray for everybody, and we can pray that God's will be done, his kingdom come. Prioritize. Your God whom you serve continually. Faithful obedience may not be flashy, but I guarantee people will notice. What do people notice about you? Do people know what political party 
you're part of what presidential candidate you support. That's okay if they know that. It's okay if you talk about that, if that's important to you. But as Christians, we ought to be best known for our loyalty to Jesus and our service to his kingdom. And that leads into point number four. Never confuse the fragile kingdoms of earth with the eternal, unstoppable, untoppable kingdom of heaven. Everything that you see around you, all the power structures, everything is passing away. None of it will last except the reign of Jesus. His kingdom will come. His will will be done. Heavenly citizenship and earthly citizenship can coexist, but if and when they may contradict, we must be clear about where our ultimate loyalties lie. We may all make different choices this November at the ballot box. We may vote for different candidates. We may have different reasons. But through it all, our loyalty to King Jesus should be more well-known than our loyalty to any political party or presidential candidate. First Peter 2 says, Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. Jesus says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And Paul says in 1 Timothy 1, to the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor, glory forever and ever. Amen. Number five, what the court of law or the court of public opinion, let there be no lack of evidence in proving your faithfulness. Let there be no lack of evidence in proving your faithfulness. It was well known to everybody that Daniel served the Lord continually. I remember in high school, I was blessed to go to a Christian high school. Not a religious high school only, but a Christian high school where genuine born-again Christians were my teachers. And I remember Mr. Haney's classroom, as in those small schools, he taught multiple high school classes. I think he taught psychology and history and Bible and several other things, drama as well. But he had a sign in his classroom that said, if you were put on trial for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? And I saw that every single day when I went to his class, and it made a difference in my thinking. You are the light of the world, Jesus said. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. So let your light shine. And if you were ever put on trial for being a Christian, ever put on trial because of your faithfulness, let there be no lack. Of evidence. And number six, thank God. Give thanks to the Lord for shutting the lion's mouths every single day. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, he has delivered you from the ultimate voracious enemy called death. He's delivered you. He's delivered you from the kingdom of the evil one. The lion who prowls around seeking to devour you. Every single day, he is shutting the mouths of lions. Even when you don't even realize it. Give him thanks for his deliverance. Some people say, I wish I could be like Daniel. I wish I could spend a night in a pit with lions. That'd be kind of cool. I'd like that. I wish God would show up like that for me. God does show up like that for you. He is with you as a Christian. He is delivering you. Give him thanks. You know, for me, one of the lions I deal with is overly valuing the opinions of others. I care too much about what people may think of me. And so in groups like this where I'm around brothers and sisters in Christ and Christian fellowship, well, yeah, it's easy to shine a light in this kind of a setting. But what about other settings where... People don't share that same opinion as me. What about other settings where I know people will think very negatively of me when I am outspoken for Jesus? You know, there's a part of me that cares too much what people think, and so I have to give that to the Lord. And the Lord shuts the mouth of the lion. It's a little lion. It, like, whispers little lies in my ears. The Lord shuts the mouths of that lion so that I can obey and live faithfully. What lions 
are in your life. Thanks be to God. He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Through our Savior, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit within we are safe and secure, even when the flames burn hot, even when the lions roar. So let me ask you, are there lions roaring in your life today? Are there people who oppose your faith, enemies who want to take you down, forces that want to take you out? Yes, Dorothy, in this Wizard of Oz kind of year, 2020 has been a real lions and tigers and bears, oh my, sort of experience. But Christians don't need to fear. Christ is with us. That's what his name means, Emmanuel, God with us. Deliverance is near. He is coming. He will return. He will call us home. And we don't need to fear. If you don't have Jesus, then you have a lot of reasons to fear. In all honesty, you know Jesus, you will know fear. But if you know Jesus, if you have a relationship with him, you have no true reason to fear. I'm not saying you won't deal with fear, but you know the one who has dealt with it who has confident, who has given you every single thing you need for life and godliness. Know Jesus. Know Jesus, and you will conquer the fearful and ferocious lions in your life. Gracious Father in heaven, first of all, I pray for the person that doesn't know Jesus. I pray for the person, I can't even imagine what it must be like going through this year and not having the hope of the kingdom of heaven, not having the confidence of Christ Jesus, not having the security of the Holy Spirit who dwells within, not having a father in heaven to talk to. God, I can't imagine the person going through 2020 and lacking the resources that we have as Christians. And so right now, Father, I pray for that person who may be listening who is trying to do this on their own. I pray for that man or woman who is listening right now, who is attempting by their own power, by their own strength, to get this done. And they're floundering, they're flailing about, and they're feeling miserably. God, I pray that that person will fall on their knees before you, like Daniel looking toward you and saying, God, I'm a sinner. Please forgive us our sins. May that person look to you, Jesus, and say, Jesus, I believe you died on the cross for me, and I believe you rose from the grave, and I want to love you more. I want to learn to know you and to follow you. Come into my life, Lord Jesus, and lead me. God, I pray that that person who doesn't know the hope I have in Christ will turn to Jesus right now and live, experience hope for the very first time. To know Jesus and to know that he has conquered every lion. He has triumphed over every fear. And for us as Christians, may we know and experience every day the hope that we have in Christ. And may we live such courageous lives of faithful obedience, step by step, in the same direction, continually serving the Lord our God. May we be so well known as Christians that there's no denying our faithfulness, that the evidence compiles and proves if we're one thing, we're a Christian. Help us to be known like Daniel, to dare to be a Daniel, to dare to have a purpose firm, to dare to make it known, even if that means standing alone. Because we know that we are never alone. There is another in the fire. There is an angel who shuts the mouths of the line. And we thank you, O oh God, for being with us. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said? Amen. 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 Let's stand together. We're going to raise our hands in blessing to those around us as we say together, May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. 
May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 Now, Debbie's back there with the jazz, bless hands.